Dogs of Warcry is a podcast from the Mortal Realms focusing on Warcry, a fast-paced cinematic skirmish game by Games Workshop. You can expect discussions on gameplay, rules, lore, terrain, painting, campaigns, events, and more. In episode four of season six, we will explore the vastness of the hobby when your entire warband is the same size or smaller than a single Age of Sigmar unit. We will cover warband themes, painting, basing, conversions, and various accoutrements that make Warcry one of the more superior hobby games, at least in our minds. Uh, my name is Eric, and uh, with me for the very first time is a local hobby sensation, uh, Zach. Uh, thanks for joining me tonight, man. Welcome uh, to your first episode of Dogs of Warcry. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I appreciate the praise. Um, I definitely enjoy painting, enjoy hobbying, and enjoy playing Warcry, so I'm happy to be here. If... Uh, if there wasn't the game, would you still be painting the miniatures? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I'd consider myself a painter first. I've always considered myself a painter first and I've been painting for, I don't know, close to 10 years now. And I've only been playing more cry about a year and a half. So okay. I played so, fantasy back in the day and I've just been painting ever since. Nice. Well, we, uh, our local group is all the better for having you. And I'm looking forward to talking hobby with you on this episode. Uh, we've been, uh, you know, this is our sixth season and we, we, this topic comes up every couple seasons or so, but it's always good to refresh, think about, uh, you know, what's available, what's news, things that, that we haven't talked about. And, um, you know, you, you use some things, uh, in your hobby repertoire that I don't use. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Josh and Vin couldn't be, couldn't be here because both of them, uh, are also, uh, you know, uh, Josh is a heavy converter and uh, explorer of things. And Vint is probably the fastest speed painter that I know. Uh, oh, yeah. He can turn over an army in a night uh, to get it ready for a tournament. So unfortunately, we won't have their feedback on this one, uh, this episode, but we'll maybe catch uh, a, a tip or two in, in future episodes uh, so they can share their piece. To kick things off, uh, we're going to go straight to the Forge of Mithraxis. What have you been hobbying on uh, most recently? Yeah, um, most recently I've been, I started this thing after I got back from a vacation where I've just been trying to hobby every day and it mm -hmm. has been, I don't something about it has been the best thing ever. I've been, I think I'm at like 45 days in a row now hmm. and I've been painting like a storm. Um, most recently I finished, uh, I finished a Stormcast Eternals uh mostly proxy <laughs> warband um and then i'll talk about that when we talk about our games played yeah so i finished them off that's it's about 1700 points in warcry because i wanted some room for allies and expansion during the narrative season and i also finished a something that i'm very proud of it's a display board slash um, terrain piece and it's a floating airship that's for this um, steampunk themed Warband, and I'm very proud of it. It's awesome. It's got flashing lights and everything. It's it's pretty cool. And finished that about last week, and I'm back on the painting desk with some more Seraphon. That's awesome. I've I've known a few people that take on that sort of everyday, you know, hobby challenge, and and sometimes you know they'll count anything. Like if they sit down for five minutes and paint a little bit, um, they'll count it, and it just keeps the momentum, keeps it going. Uh, I think that's a good it's a good mentality use for a lot of things that you want to just improve on and work your way through some stuff. Um, and I know that when I, if, if I sit down and get stuff done, I'm pretty quick. You know, yeah. I, I, I have my techniques down. I have my, my paint that I like to use. I know my colors that I like to use for things. And so, um, uh, when I, when I do get a chance to sit down, I can go quickly, but sometimes it takes me a bit to just get to the table and yeah. I, I know that it, it could be better. So last, actually last week I've been, um, I wouldn't say, I would say almost every day this past week I've been at the table. Um, I've been working on, um, I, I declared to the world in meaning our discord, uh, the mortal realms.com forward slash discord, uh, that I was going to work on my cog fort next. I was like, what, what am I going to do? I'm going to pull out my cog fort. I'm going to keep working on that. Uh, and then I, I so I, 
I, I pulled it out and I pushed it back and then I, uh, painted my mop pit. Um, yeah. and, uh, it was a lot of fun, a lot of cool, different textures, so many different textures in that. And I tried, it all matches my, um, Gnarlwood, uh, terrain. Um, and in turn, I'm really happy how that turned out. Um, I've started painting gorgers for, um, uh, for my son back before, like about a month and a half ago. Uh, I got them all like the base coating airbrushed, um, you know, kind of underpainted and, uh, overpainted and, um, working on the highlighted all the skin. And then I kind of stopped. Uh, so I'm working on the bones and the leather and all that kind of stuff that's on there. And I've got three of them done. So I've got okay. two more, two more to get, get finished off and, and we'll be, and then we got to work on the basing. And my son decided he wants like uh crumbled stone, like flagstone basing, which is all like got to custom make all that. So thanks. Thanks miles. Uh, <laughs> no, he's, it's going to be cool. And then um, th just as an aside, uh, I've always wanted the black stone fortress amble. Uh, yeah. It's kind of that in insect hulking insect thing. Uh, and it was always too expensive because that game, they didn't print enough of it. And so scalpers, you know, grabbed it and they sell it for like 80 to 90 bucks online. And they put out a new combat patrol that used it. And so now you, I got it for like 40 bucks, which is still a lot for, but it's, it was almost like, that's almost like you, you know, that's what you get a hero model for. Yeah. So, they sell um, heroes for 35. So that's actually a pretty good deal. Yeah. Yeah. I got a good deal on it. And I can't wait. Uh, it's going, I think it's going to make be like either an, uh, Ogroid, um, uh, Myrmidon sure. or, um, I think, I think it's probably the right size for that. So I might, okay. I might do that. Um, it's got big, long arms and those. Yeah, I love that claws. model. It's yeah. so cool. It would fit right in with Sylvaneth too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With their insect stuff. Uh, I do think I'm going to try and do some posing, something I'd like to see its mandibles out a little bit more. Sure. And then maybe it's arm raised in, in a slashing motion. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, so I've had the hobby, a little bit more of the hobby bug, getting some more stuff done recently, and I'm, I'm enjoying it. Uh, and I'll get to that cog for at some point. Um, well, like we said, uh, you and I, we both paint to get models on the table. Um, and we've had a couple of all painted games over the last few weeks, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. uh between your terrain, my terrain, we get in our, our armies, we can set it down we can get a fully painted game going, which isn't, it's not like it's the most special in the world, but that's, I mean, well, it looks, cool. it looks cool. We'll talk it's about that. We'll talk, we'll talk exactly about that in our, uh, in our main topic in our victory condition. Uh, why don't we go though to our games played? Um, you know, we were in league together. Uh, you know, I went to an event, uh, recently, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, la on the last episode, I had mentioned that I was heading up to, or I had gone to Dan Herrera's, um, gnarled goose chase narrative match play event um and uh joking uh had some fun with that um uh that the big joke is that mike so i went up with mike and vint and then yep. my son came up too and this is my first time taking him like traveling with him to an event which he was had so much fun and very appreciative and uh came to round three and my son went up against mike and mike beat an 11 year old like come on mike gosh that's just, just bad manners. <laughs> so dad had to come up ah, <laughs> and uh, avenge the boy. Um, but it, uh, which was uh, a really, f I, th it was a, it was a fun game. Uh, the scenario being objective based. I think I, I brought a better list than Mike did with his wrestler, his WWE uh, wrestlers versus my uh, cog ribdis in the seven dwarves. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so, we we got through a few turns and the writing was on the wall um and uh i took out the victory so yeah, uh, him. took down the tournament too i i took down the tournament so that was uh that was uh take i had uh three and oh or three and one so i had one i think i had a loss this is the third game i think i lost um so it was a fun event. Everybody was so cool to play against. There were some beautiful armies, uh, war bands painted, which when you, you know, a lot of, uh, age or sorry, games workshop events, people 
bring painted miniatures. It's part of the joy of this. But war again, war cry war bands in particular look pretty great uh, uh, when you get them all together. So how about you? Uh, well, so after that, uh, we started a new league. I've been playing Soul or uh, Soul Blight, uh, which is um, I've had Soul Blight. This is one of my first armies in kind of trans as I, I built. The, I was building that army in the transition from uh, Warhammer Fantasy to Age of Sigmar. I've got a pretty good sized one, all converted and uh, well painted, and, and but I've always held off of it because Soul Blight is known as a pretty strong war band so or faction. So I don't try and take the you know the known hard stuff. Yeah, but I figured, you know, uh, I've been getting my teeth stomped in a f <laughs> some so, with certain warband choices recently. Yeah. So I thought I would, I thought I would give it a go and and just see what the part of the way you learn how to fight against things is by playing it, right? So yeah, um, so I've been playing uh, a um a white king on skeletal steed. I think it's hands down the best hero that they've got. Two hundred and seventy points is a lot, but it does a lot of work yeah. um and it doesn't have fly but it has movement and stuff um and it and it just crashes down on things um and then a lot of grave guard and skeletons to start i Can't most recently wrong. uh allied in a um uh vargulf courtier because another very fine ally within the yes. death faction um so i've i think i'm i'm half and half wins and losses because skeletons still die uh yeah they do uh so um i my most notable uh in my games this past week um uh joe had an annihilator uh with a quad and i had some uh dire wolves blocking so my general came in with some dire wolves uh thralls to block you know kind of um guard him as a wall and i ended up sending them off and i said come at me <laughs> and uh the annihilator came up and uh i think did all of like six damage uh yeah, and and it. and i made the wrong choice i think i i had done some damage to him with a counter um uh he may have done more damage to me but with with 28 wounds it wasn't it wasn't it didn't feel like a lot yeah. uh and instead of just i had uh that uh creating on five artifact instead of just taking two attacks against him i did a wait and brought back a model and then i did an attack and brought back a model um okay. because i was trying to uh i was trying to keep him from getting victory points for the mission yeah but, we were playing a reaper style but that was a one point thing and he got yeah. I should have just I should have just nailed that annihilator and I would yeah. I would have had him uh, because the next round he got initiative and he he had to make three at three attacks in order to take me down and I countered uh, I could have uh, I could have killed him through counters had I had I had another uh, um, attack into him so lesson learned but it was it was a fun oh, one. It, was a, it was a really fun uh, you know kind of moment in the game uh, so I really appreciated that um yeah so it was it was some good games i've been i've been having fun playing with them and uh, uh i'm excited i will say i'm been looking at the city new, new cities of sigmar um, yeah. and i've been looking at them so maybe i'll go back to cities of sigmar next time but we'll see anyway head of myself, yeah, ahead of myself. Fun. how have your games been how's um, the league, league treating you the league's going well i'm playing thunderstrike stormcast is yeah. the uh warband frame i guess i'm using yeah the models i'm using are not stormcast they're mostly uh they're mostly war machine hordes models and various other ones um but they're all steampunk guys and heavy armor so stormcast was kind of the right base sizes the right model sizes for it and we started at 800 points which is a little slim for a stormcast list so yeah. i was playing three annihilators a griff hound and um a Praetor. And that was that's been a little rough. The first five models were they can't do a lot on the board when there's only five of them, especially when you know they don't show up to round two or three. Yeah. But I've been able to slowly expand the warband in points and I picked up Kalthia too. So she is a multiplier. Yeah, that 
Kathia seems very, very good. This is the first time I've used her in a warband, and she's really made my warband uh, a whole lot better. Yeah. So for this week, I can't even think back to previous weeks, but for this week, um, I brought my airship to the battlefield because it was finally finished, and I put it on the middle and a turn on a airbrush turntable, and we played where if you finish an action on the on the airship, it all because it spots for models to stand on it. Mm -hmm. I would roll a, we'd roll a scatter die and then point the nose of the airship in whatever direction the scatter die rolled. Nice. So it was a fun little um, centerpiece, and obviously there was some movement shenanigans, and sometimes it doesn't matter, sometimes it does. It was a good, a good fun time, and uh, I was playing Mike, speak of the devil. Uh, <laughs> he's playing Iron Jaws in the league, and I, play, I played yep. him on the board, and I managed to eke out a victory with a, a timely rampage uh, in, a, in the Reaper mission. Yeah. But unfortunately, as my leader was running away, his big old mega boss was able to grab onto the side of the ship, spin around 30 degrees because he was <laughs> he got the random scattered eye roll. The point right at my leader jumped off and knocked my leader out. So <laughs> I took I took the mission, but he took the moral victory in the end. Yeah. His remaining model. Man, I, I love that. I mean, I I I you know, my, my Talaxis board has like moving tiles. I love that your terrain piece, uh, you put it on that, uh, that foresight to be able to just move things. It, it, it makes for a really dynamic, uh, experience, uh, yes. when you have, have terrain that moves around or can, can do stuff and you can just ride it. Uh, what is it? What was it called? Uh, <laughs> airship. It's no, what, what was, what were the, what were the youth doing uh, a couple oh. years ago where it was like ghost riding where you'd like, put a car in uh drive and then you'd like ride on the hood or something like that. You no, know? I, don't, just, I never did that. Yeah, no, but people did. Some people did. Sure. Um, anyway, uh, that's really cool. And uh, just to, to mention uh, this season um, of our league, we are doing the Soreth core campaign out of the Tome of Champions 2020, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, or 2021, I think it's 2020, uh, which obviously we were all stuck in our houses when that came out. Um, and so we dug it back out. Josh dug it back out, kind of put some house rules in place and we're doing it over, I think 12 weeks. Yeah. At so, least yeah. so with, with delays for the holidays, of course. Right. Right. So this is going to be our, our longest single, um, league. Uh, but we're, we are, kind of invested in this this game we're going to see how it is and it's cool to play through these mechanics and then see how that you know affects our you know things events that we run at adepticon or locally etc so um but yeah so yeah that i i can't wait to play on the on the nimbus and yeah. uh and and see how skeletons do in clouds yeah i'll pull it out next week the the uh the Vargo of Col Cur Cortier will enjoy uh, flying oh, yeah. around in it. Absolutely. Well, then why don't we move ourselves? Uh, I, I, I've got a headache. Uh, <laughs> my vision is uh, maddening. Uh, so we'll go over to the visions of madness where we learn about new announcements, uh, any speculation we have on future things. Um, and we got a whole load of uh, downloadable PDFs. That's our big kind yeah. of, it's, it's raining pdfs uh from games workshop uh they uh released the savage lands uh terrain rules um so the scales of talax sorry the so savage lands scales of talaxis rules are free to download um so if you have gotten that kit and built it and you want you know other, everybody can see what those are or if you want to model your own and and uh you know do some stuff like that you can use those rules um uh what was what's another one that uh, you enjoyed out of the pdfs that dropped well, unfortunately, no lizard men. I'm a big Seraphon guy, but uh, they did come out with new profiles for all the Cities of Sigmar units and completely yeah. revamped how Cities of Sigmar works in Warcry. Yeah, yep. I mean, that was a it was a really big section of of the compendium, uh, and you know, flipping to like five different cities uh, rules to choose from was a lot of, of yeah. things. It was a cool variety, but you know, in the end, usually you still picked a few things out of there the, mm -hmm. the things the cream rises to the top and so um we've got new humans dark elves uh dispossessed um they call them different things i don't yes uh but then um 
a lot of pro fighter profiles gone. Everything that, you know, uh, the, the big one for me, Demi Griffs, I've got a conversion I've been working on that could still yeah. work for the writers that, that they have. Um, um, so the Demi Griffs are gone. Uh, lots of uh, wood elves are gone. Uh, yeah. Have you read through the, the that PDF much yet? Yeah, I, I took a pretty good look at it. And basically the gist of it, for anybody who hasn't yet, was they took out, they basically removed existing cities of Sigmar and added three new factions. One that's humans, one that's elves, one that's dwarves. Mm -hmm. And they're all independent factions. So you can you can take heroes as allies between them as you, as normal, but you can't just mix and match random dwarves and random elves. Yeah. Um, from from the kind of highlights for me, the dispossessed dwarves are not tough five to start. I don't think. Uh, they they put at them about fifteen points, which is good. They, they yes, thank goodness. They cost a little bit more now. Yeah. Um, and uh, the the bulwark across cities, everybody. If you had the bulwark, which is the shield uh, rune, you could for a double get plus one toughness. Um, there's that that's still floating around a little bit with I think the actually I think the the elves have that now. Um, uh, just the elves. Um, the dwarves get something a little bit different. Um, the cities have a have a interesting. Sorry, the cast castellite um, faction. Uh, which is the humans have some interesting mechanics that I hope to to cover at some point. Um, yeah. Um, and the the I guess one of the ones in the last Hunter and Hunted uh, book, there was a profile for a War Hulk that was really fun, really good. Yeah. Uh, and so we've got it, but they came out with a completely different um, profile of, for yeah. for that one. Uh, it, it, I mean, it does different things. It's not as like it's. It's still good. Like I think there's yes. still there's some good utility to it, and it's an it's an okay. It's like a the old one, the one that was in the Hunter and Hunted was similar to like a Kernoth Hunter. Yeah, and I would say this Hulk is a little less, not quite as strong as a Kernoth Hunter, okay. um, but uh, has some other utility that really kind of buffs the other units. I so. think it. I think it's pretty good. I think that they changed they changed from the hunter and hunted book they changed the shooting attack to be a little less swingy it's more attacks but less damage per attack now which mm -hmm. take that for what you will but yeah. i still think it's a pretty good piece it's quite tanky it has decent movement it has pretty good melee and it does have a shooting attack that it can just yep. throw out if it's forcing people to come in so i think it's a good piece yeah yeah and it can uh it can give um there's a reaction that they have that uh can give them both plus one toughness and uh does two wounds back to the to the attacker on misses all misses hey, uh and like fun. one is if the they have to be within three inches of a friendly fighter that has either the bulwark or the elite and they do the bulwark does the plus one toughness the elite does the two wounds back and the war hulk is the only model that has both so yeah it's a good, good, good utility piece to kind of help with that I've been looking for a fast moving uh, elite model to give already tough mo models like the horses sure. um, have tough five. And so if they're running around and could get that buff, um, then they're, you know, doing two wounds back on counters and stuff like that. Um, the only thing I can find is uh, Medusa or the, the Medusa or not the Medusa, yeah. the, the Gorgai. Uh, um, the Medusa is the one off the cauldron and the Gorgai is from the kit. Yeah, the Gorgai is the, the snake bottom. Uh, yeah. th those are move seven. Okay. So they're a little faster and they're elite. But there's not many other elite heroes. Oh, does it have to have the elite rune mark? Uh-huh. Okay. It just says fr friendly fighters with the elite, so it's not faction specific. Yeah, I was going to say... I. I'm not too hot on them, but the Pterodon and the Ripperdactyl Chief are quite fast, but mm, they don't have yep. elite. Yep, yep. So, well, I don't know if we can break it quite yet. No, um, not yet. Well, I am very excited uh, in White Dwarf 494, and I don't know if that'll have come out by the time this airs, but saw the preview for it. Uh, we're finally getting the Underworld uh, Nether Maze uh, rules. <laughs> um, really? And... I got. I can't remember which ones. I think that is Skittershanks Claw Pack. Yep. 
uh, Shadeborn, uh, the Shadeborn, which are the other one that's like the Dark Canine Elves. Shadow Stalkers. Yep, yep. Uh, which it's just, yeah, it'll be interesting because they get another hero version. I haven't looked to see if they're, I can't wait to see if, how similar the hero profiles are. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we got, and uh, we got the Gore Chosen. Oh, they're so cool. And everybody's uh, most anticipated, I think, are the Hexbane's Hunters. Uh, okay. Uh, we got, uh, uh, we got a lot of people anticipating what, what that's going to bring for us. So. I'm um, partial to the the Gore Chosen models. I think they're fantastic. Yeah, um, you know, those four war bands, they're my favorite. But yeah, that leader yeah, cool. is the most oh like God. he's so cool. Most like uh, Aztecs, like Mesoamerican, mm -hmm. uh, uh, ever. And is this the one where the guy? Which war band has the guy with like the mask? Is there an Underworlds one where the guy's got the like mask and like horns or has that one already been out? Yeah. So Gore Chosen of Drom is the the Aztec looking leader. It has the, I think it's called the Gore Hulk, which is the guy turning into a Korgorath, which is I think oh. the one you're talking about. Okay. And it, it also has a big pot bellied guy with a flaming hammer. But That's right. Chub, chubby uh, yeah. corn. We're like, yeah. there was actually one of those, the, the whip guy from the original box mm -hmm. was a bit bigger. And we're like, you know what? <laughs> you can be big and beefy um so can't wait to see uh what those are and and see what those um bladeborn are gonna do to the to the game and one more uh what's the last oh, yeah. uh last download that we get well unfortunately i don't have the uh notes uh, in front of me uh it's nave oh yeah. nave black talent yeah that was a sweet warband the Black Talons, that's a five model warband, um, just straight out of the box, comes to just under a thousand points, so you can play them straight up. It's Nave Black Talon, who's a really good Stormcast hero. Um, mm -hmm. Two kind of Annihilator type hero uh, models, and then one Stormcast with a gun, sorry, a bow, um, and then a Idaneth wizard. And they're pretty cool. Nave does a lot of damage. I think to get to get them to seven or to just about a thousand points, they had to beef her up quite a bit. She's got like yes. six attacks, um, which I th might be the most base of any pro fighter profile. I'm, I'm not trying sure. to think, trying to think of another one. I'm, I've seen four. I've seen five. One. I don't know if I've seen five. Uh, I think I've, I've seen five. five. Un Untamed beast. I think has five. Yeah. Um, That's a fun so, orbit. Yeah. I've seen I've seen a couple lists floating around where you drop the Idaneth and the gun Stormcast and you pull in, um, I think if you pull in Kixie Taka and the Starblood Stalker mm -hmm. Skinks, you can get up to, I think, seven models. Oh, nice. Which is pretty competitive with yeah. three big Stormcast in there. Yeah, and let Nave run around and do her thing. I've got the old Nave model, which is pretty sweet. I like that. Yeah, they're a little, little partial. Beautiful models. All yeah. the Nave models are great. Those axes are just sweet looking. And she might be the first uh, named character to have two models. I don't know of another. Um, the oh, the Ionis. Ionis yeah. Cripborn now has a second model. Now he's riding a dragon. What a glow up! Yeah, and if if you want to count all the forty k guys, I'm sure they've got like twenty models each. But yeah, well, we're we're staying in fantasy squarely. Yeah. Um, so that's, what's been dropping, uh, no news, uh, yet, no previews yet. There's a preview coming up. Um, Ooh, I don't have a date on that though. I didn't write that down. Is that end of it's November? This weekend, this oh, weekend, this weekend, which would be the 11th or 12th. Unfortunately, okay. there's no work cry on that as far as I'm aware, okay. but there is underworlds. So yeah, there's yeah. going to be a Seraphon underworlds war band calling it now. <laughs> um, what do you think about, um, you, you've probably, I've said it before is in that I don't believe that we're going to get a new printed compendium uh, where we go back and get new, like everything's newly pointed, you know, um, I think. Uh, but I was also surprised that we got, I wasn't sure how they were going to handle like all the new cities yeah. cities and Seraph, you know, we haven't gotten Seraphon, like you said, all their new stuff. Yeah. Flesh Eater Court is coming out soon, I think, or it's yeah. the last one to kind it's of the last book, last book. Um, and so that's going to probably get some new models. Uh, 
how do you think they're going to, is this how they're going to handle everything moving forward is uh, just updating these PDFs? I, don't know. I would, I would certainly appreciate that um, because they haven't updated Slaves to Darkness, Seraphon, um, Iron Draws, and then all of a sudden they just came out with Cities of Sigmar. And in theory, also, like you said, Flesh Eater Quartz is going to have some new stuff. So I think, honestly, I think that once Flesh Eater Quartz has a big refresh, I think they might come back into a full pass of all the new models. Okay. I cannot wait for the new Seraphon. I'm, like I said earlier, I'm a Seraphon player through and through. So I'd what love if, to see what they come up with. What if they break it? Like, the, the only thing I would be really sad to see go is the reaction that turns crits into hits. If they got rid of that, I would be a little disappointed. Yeah. Otherwise, they can mess with the profiles and the abilities, whatever. You'll find you'll find the strength, whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, um, yeah, I think that we're probably. It feels like we're going to. You're right. I mean, we're coming to the end of kind of getting the last books uh, for third edition figured out, mm -hmm. and with that, and and probably the unless they come out with a brand new faction. That's um, true you know uh i don't know that we're updating any like getting a ton of new models it could they could go to more like war bands and focus more on that sort of stuff um mm -hmm. uh we don't know what uh yeah so i don't know whether or not they're gonna print a new book or if we're gonna get just pdfs which i think i think at the end of the day they'd probably do pdfs just because with the main rules being free um and like all of the, I'm pretty sure most of the Underworlds models have like profiles that are free as well. So yeah, I don't think that they really see the value in printing a book with just updated profiles. I don't think that that would be the yeah. best seller from them. But you know, if, if we get new rules, I, any way we get them, I would be happy. Yeah, I do. I will say my, my theory was that they were going to build out all the bespoke war bands and then stop updating new age of sigmar models but i think they just want to sell models no matter what yeah so, I, I doubt that that'll ever happen honestly yeah. i wish that they didn't have bladeborne uh rules at all but obviously people ask for them and it sells models so they write rules for them yeah i it's it's fun to have options uh yeah um anyway it's uh it was great to get all those new rules it's a ton of new stuff to like oh, yeah. pour, pour over and think about and see what you're gonna um pull in my my even though i lost uh demigriffs like i said i think i could probably turn them into cav the ca cavaliers oh, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely and uh depending on base sizes which here's a here's a little rant <laughs> the new games workshop website is garbage yep <laughs> straight garbage uh no i i appreciate that they try to refresh and do something new but the the old like this is a a digital catalog of everything we have like i i remember the old one before this new like the one before this yeah was the most functional before that it was it, it was like links and you'd click and like you'd <laughs> get pages or whatever um the last website was a gem of like yeah. being able to quickly go through. I don't know how often I'd go, you know, to their website just to look at the range and find names mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. The only bad thing about the old website was that the search was terrible. It was yes. almost impossible to like just do a quick search to find what you were looking for. And it, it was like it took forever to load for whatever reason whenever mm -hmm. I tried it. Yeah. Um, but the new site. They don't have any of the 360 degree turnarounds. Yeah, those are broken. Um, and there's no, the description information does not include base sizes. And I'm, as a converter, I'm constantly going, finding out what like base size a particular unit or model uses so that when I convert it, I can use the appropriate base size. And there's a, um, I believe that there is a pinned comment on the large Warcry Discord where somebody compiled all the base sizes for Warcry models. If you uh, do some digging or if I find that, I might shoot it your way because there is a resource because people are having trouble with finding the right base sizes, especially for models that went out of print that yeah. are still in Warcry. So okay. somebody went through and made all the base sizes in a big PDF. So. Well, thank you, whoever you are. You're a base hero. Yeah. Um, all right. 
we got one more thing to talk about before we hit our victory condition, and that is the circle of pain. And uh, since of the three of us that are doing this, yeah, I'm the only one here. I'm automatically ahead. There you go. Easy win. So anybody who's thinking that I'm going to slow play this, <laughs> uh, I'm already ahead. I've got five of my six bases glued down. Oh. And then I looked at like the objects on them are glued down. But then I realized one of them, I'm like, that doesn't seem very treasury. Like you're not going to move that or pick that up, but it's fine. Yeah, I'm gonna, it may it may lose me the overall votes, but You'll be uh, and I'll say one of my treasures is a sentient being. So we'll see how that goes. We'll see how that wow. goes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I uh, I had a one of the models from the Celestial Hurricaneum is this just like wizard dude yeah. who's studying, and I was able to like turn his head up. And he's got like a <laughs> scroll and then on some books and stuff is a telescope looking up and his head's positioned to where he's like looking right up into it. Oh, that's cool. And so he's wandering, he's wandering around like stargazing <laughs> and someone's just going to snatch him up. Snatch him up. Uh, he's got, no, he's, he's my, he's the knowledge. Uh, so we'll see. Um, can't, can't wait to see those. What base size did you end up going with on those? Uh, we actually, Josh printed up uh, tokens. That, oh. uh, that were the exact size of the tokens that come That's in. That's awesome. So we've got 3D printed bases that are the hexa or octagons. Yeah. I might have to ask Josh for a couple of those. I think I think making those terrain style base uh, or objective tokens is really cool. Well, I'd like to. Uh, we mentioned that we got the, I mean, we got the inspiration from you. Uh, you have a full it. set of, yes. of, um themed uh tokens that you could use for treasure or for objectives um so yeah i i theme them after my gnarlwood terrain and i think when i probably going to do about one table's worth of terrain a year and when i go around to do another table i definitely want to make some more tokens because it just adds so much to the overall look and theme of the set of terrain to have custom objective or treasure tokens yeah all right so I'm automatically ahead because uh, Josh, what do you, how far are you? What? What was that? How about you, Vint? What are you guys slow playing me? <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, you guys couldn't be here. I'm just I'm just jabbing at you. It's fine. All right. Uh, let's move to our victory condition. The reason that you and I are here uh, tonight uh, to talk about. Uh, the extravagance of our hobby uh, when all our focuses can be on just a handful of models, uh, amazing terrain. Uh, let's talk about speed painting, heavy conversions, all of it. Let's, I, I can't wait for it. Let's dig into it. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a question. 10,000 foot view. You can say as much or as little as you want. Why is war cry? one of the superior hobby games in your in your opinion what makes it such a good hobby game yeah in, in my mind there's two main things one is the size of the the war bands you have pretty self-contained war bands so you can take the time to go out of your way and do weird stuff do more interesting stuff spend a little bit more time on the models and so you can really get a wide variety of of themes as you work your way through the 50 or so factions there are in Warcry. And the second thing in my mind is how open the community is to being a little relaxed on what models look like. I know you and I both don't always use the official models for warbands and just being able to then pick any models from anywhere, not just Games Workshop, and use them in Warcry is a ton of fun. And quite frankly, because there's 50 factions, nobody knows all the rules. So you say, this is this model, it has this profile. and most people are okay with that because most people don't have every faction memorized. And if they do, you can just say, well, this one is an annihilator and everybody knows what that does. <laughs> yeah. I mean, half the conversions in our group are annihilators, right? <laughs> oh, they, they're pretty good. I like them. I have yet to use one. Maybe that's what I have to do next is annihilate. Yeah. Um, 
I think I think uh, I'm going to echo that that size uh, piece. Um, not only the warband size, but the board size has mm-hmm. been um, really key. I think to building like you're you've talked you talked about build, you know you have a, a goal of building one new board a year. Um, I've started more than I finished, uh, but um, it is for the a sane person like i've got you know a couple of i've got many boards worth of terrain painted because of the size of the the of the ta- those boards you yeah. know having three to five pieces painted for it is really manageable and, and mm-hmm. easy to obtain and so um i feel like i've got a lot of options uh yeah. because of that Absolutely. and then um i think the the ability to um either go fast get painted models on the table quickly mm-hmm. uh get through a backlog quickly or get through you know to, to paint quickly or the because of that size both of those are because of the size you can go quickly or you can go deep yeah heavily convert painstakingly paint uh mm-hmm. you know take your time uh because uh you've got five to to ten models and so taking that extra you know layer to or or step to highlight or to yeah. you know whatever is is more attainable at this scale um and i think um with our hobby for me every time i've start a new uh army or warband i've tried to pick a new skill to learn or a new technique to kind of implement uh, whether it be like like my death army has a lot of green stuff uh okay. so that was me kind of learning to do that um my um uh jukari drawn has a lot of um plastic card and and materials that i wasn't used to using to build sails and stuff and use yeah. cotton so i'm always kind of using those projects and the thing to dream up and be like how can i do something new or try something different and i mean like you with your um you know, cog ship Thunderstrike, yeah. like you built the whole ship. Like, yeah, that wasn't in the plan. No, it's not really a uh, part of a war cry war band, but it's a little display board. It's about, um, it fills up a full quarter of the board when I drop it down pretty much. And I, I got a Eldar, a dark Eldar radar Raider, mm. uh, mm-hmm. to build into it, but everything else is scratch built. I used computer case fans, yogurt lids. <laughs> I used an old t-shirt I had. Um, a compass I got for free at a garage sale when I was buying some records. So it, it was a fun project and about 10 tubes of super glue. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so that kind of leads me to uh, kind of the next thing I want to talk about is in all of that sea of things, what, uh, where do you find inspiration? Um, and and yeah. the reason I ask is I think, most of this hobby like the the desire to do like to pick up an army to pick up a model and and make that a center of your army is is from being inspired by something you Mm -hmm. saw or something you read or something that that you uh experienced so what what inspires you to start a new war band or to, to, to start a new project yeah i think that i definitely draw a lot of inspiration from seeing cool models that i want to paint um a lot of the times i will see or buy or find a, a just a cool model that I'm like, you know, I don't think this needs much to change and I'd like to paint it for Warcry. How can I slot this in? Uh, this this came in with my Thunderstrike Stormcast. Um, I have the Skaven Arch Warlock model, which is Icket Claw from Fantasy. Um, and he's my favorite Skaven model of all time. And I happened across one in a store, a metal one, not the crappy resin ones, <laughs> for like 25 bucks. And I'm like, all right, I'm, I, I just bought it right there. And even though I'm not using him as a Skaven, you put him on a 40 millimeter base, you paint him up a little bit more put together and all of a sudden it looks just like any other steampunk model in my warband. So I'm, I definitely find a lot of inspiration from the models themselves. Mm-hmm. And then I find a lot of inspiration from uh, other forms of art media, um, like animated TV shows are, are a big one. Um, one that I just started is the Castlevania anime show. And mm. that thing is pretty cool. It has like just such cool themes. And when you look at 
shots from that show and you're like wow that's a really cool shot and then it it's not it's not done in a realistic way so yeah. a lot of the painting i do isn't super realistic it's it's more to try and interpret one of those themes into into a, a model so the other forms of art like tv shows or I'll, I'll see a cool piece you know on just a piece of art on reddit or you know something in a comic book or other physical book and then speaking of physical books physical books stuff i read i read a lot of fantasy um the stormlight archives are definitely my favorite if you know what those are mm. those are um and they have really good fantasy they have really cool magic that's very descriptive so even just trying to bring some of that into you know into the models is is a good place to start for me nice nice um you're a big uh fan of the seraphon oh yeah what what is it about the seraphon that has inspired so much <laughs> of your hobby um long story short they have dinosaurs and dinosaurs are very cool um honestly there's not much more to it than that i think the models are awesome i love painting the dinosaurs i love how they have such a varied um scheme that you can do I oftentimes what I'll do and what I'm doing right now um, on these skinks is I'll just pick, I'll just reach into my bucket of paints, pick out a random paint and that's the color I'll paint that skink or that lizard man. Hmm. And I think that being able to just mix it up so much is so much fun on, on Seraphon in particular. Nice. Nice. Um, for me, inspiration is often the convergence of a couple of ideas or a couple of, of model lines. Um, so, you know, I have a little bit of a problem trying to steal 40 K stuff and pull it <laughs> into fantasy. It's a little bit of an addiction so far. I've managed to pick like the first two, I picked the most non sci-fi stuff, I think, um, which were the Tyranids, uh, for my ogre army. And then, um, uh, which I mean, bugs are sci-fi, but you know, sure. they, might as, they might as well as be dinos, uh, of yeah. some sort. And then uh, the Drukari felt the most like you paint, you paint the the th paint them in earth tones, and they stop being you know leather daddies, and <laughs> and they are uh, very fantasy esque. Um, yeah, they're fun. Uh, uh, I suppose the jet engines on the back of their machines are a little bit of a, a giveaway, but um, uh, but and then for the cog for it, I was like, Who, yeah, who's how do I get cog fort stuff? How do I get mechanical legs and arms and you know that sort of stuff? And there just happened to be the Skitari and the Necromunda dwarves. And oh, yeah. you know, that stuff is they they make it so gothic that yeah, that it's just a you know a couple steps removed from fantasy, right? Um, so I can Kevin Bacon that pretty easily. Um uh so um, but for me it's sort of that convergence of uh could I make this out of this? Can I, can I, I like the idea of the cities of Sigmar and I actually do like that. The new range, I think it's growing on me. Like every time I see it, I like it more, I love it. That's uh, awesome. but I'm probably not going to buy it for that. Cause I've got these other cities of Sigmar that I've invested in, but it's, how do I make this cog for it? I want to make the cog for it. So much of it is in the lore about these cog cities and these walking um, uh, fortresses or moving fortresses. And so that sort of gets my wheels turning and then it becomes almost, it, it's easily a multi multi year. Like we're oh, coming yeah. up on like five years of building this army uh, piece by piece. And so it's sort of like, well, what you're, I'm always on the lookout for what could fit. Uh, most recently, like the Void Scarred Corsairs came out for Necromunda, and mm -hmm. they they are Drukari adjacent, and but they fit the Thunderer profile for my for my army. Mm -hmm. Like th it felt like Games Workshop was like, hey, he's got a cool army, but there's a hole in it. Let's make <laughs> these models for that. Sure. Um. So it's things like that where then you're just sort of always, I always have my eye open for what could be something that could fit into this um so yeah it's that kind of convergence of ideas of something new creating something uh, taking something that exists in one form and trying to twist it 
to be something else is often where my inspiration is. Um, where do you get the inspiration for your painting schemes? Oh, painting schemes. I mean, there is a little bit of trying not to paint two armies to look alike. Um, and so sometimes it's like, okay, I took up this space with this army. So, um, uh, my first, well, my first army, my first ar ogre army got converted. So we'll start with like my death army. It's, it's, I, I, my blacks are actually kind of a dark green, yeah. um, a muddy, mucky green, um, olive green, and then bright scarlet crimson, um, red for, you know, armor, etc., And then blue, a very pale skin, and then blue ethereal, um, you know, like it's more turquoise ethereal. So yeah. I've got bright red turquoise and then on the background of a, a very monochromatic uh, green black. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's taken. I can't use, I can't use bright red on another army now. <laughs> okay. Uh, so then I went to probably ogres next and they were orangey pink skin, uh, dusty uh, exoskeletons, uh, and then dark skinned, you know, ogres. Uh, with, well, some turquoise uh, uh -oh. war, war paint. Uh oh, he's he's breaking his own rule. I think turquoise comes up in all the armies. Okay, so turquoise is the good central. Color. It's a good so, color. It is. Um, so it's sort of like how can I, how can I similar to like trying to find a different technique? Like I'm, I, I try and come up with a new paint scheme. Um, uh, for for the cog for it was. Uh, I saw a um, a poster for a, like. Are you familiar with Ink Twenty Eight? No, but it's like uh, it's like a very low, like it was a it's a forty k or like sci fi like low tech or like okay. gr grungy sci fi. Sure. And so then they um, this guy made this art of this like mech suit with a skull mm. head, but it's submerged in water and it's oxidizing. Oh, that's cool. And so I, I, I tried my best. Like sometimes you see it and you're just like, it looks cool. And I tried my best to like figure out what I would layer to get that effect. Mm -hmm. And it is the most, it's like an army green and then a rust orange and then a, a fluorescent green and then a turquoise. Yeah. There's a turquoise. There you go. But like trying to get the layers so that it feels like that picture that I saw. So some of it is like just trying to occupy a new space yeah make it fun um and then uh and then some of it like in this case it was like oh i think that would be cool for a cog army to yeah just have all, everything oxidized like that how yeah. about you like what um what inspires you to 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 pick a paint scheme or to explore that yeah um like i said earlier if i see a piece of art usually it's like maybe a scene in a film or something um, that will usually inspire one of the more dramatic schemes that I go for. Cause oftentimes some of the most cool th themes in films are, are almost monochromatic. I'm thinking of Darth Vader coming into the, uh, the rebel ship at the end of rogue one. And mm -hmm. it's like, that scene's so cool. And the lighting is awesome. And the colors are awesome. And it's like the red lightsaber and, and a couple more lights. Yeah. And when you look at, when you pull up, if you like did, pick color droppers off of that scene, it would all be shades of red, but somehow, you know, it just, with the way it's, it's set up, that just makes it work. So pulling an inspiration from something like that is, is definitely big for me. Yeah. How much, um, how much do you, uh, explore like of the, the hobby tools or all the things that are afforded us? Yeah. How much your painter first? So, how much of your like hobby, how I put it, uh, war chest, yeah, is is in the paint stuff as opposed to, you know, putty or you know the right clippers mm -hmm. or or you know that sort of thing. Like, yeah, what what kinds of paint stuff have you yeah. been able to explore? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, quite frankly, I'm pretty bare bones when it comes to hobby materials. I'm using. Oh. I'm using the same uh, old pair of Citadel nippers from 10 years ago. I've got an X-Acto knife. 
Um, and then as far as paints go, I pretty much, I mainly use standard acrylics. Um, the AK third gen stuff has been pretty nice to me recently, but what I do is, you know, if I need a red, I'll go to the store and buy whatever red they have. I don't, I don't necessarily go buy an entire paint set. I don't necessarily buy a specific paint. I mix a lot of colors because quite frankly, nothing, nothing looks all the same in real life. If you looked at, you know, a group of, of 50 whatevers, the only time that'll be perfectly exactly the same is if they were like marching in a parade. Hmm. If, if you go look at, you know, a group of iguanas sitting on the beach in Florida, they're, they're not all the same color. So being able to mix and find close enough colors that yeah. really looks good in the aggregate when you highlight them with similar colors, when you give them similar colors for shadow, it really helps give a lot of realistic variation. So I really enjoy having a limited selection of paints. I don't have a big paint rack of paints. I have a small toolbox and I honestly, I probably use 20 paints out of there the most. Yeah. Um, as far as other tools, I did, I do have some oil paints and I've been absolutely loving using oil paints. Hmm. I only have three. I have a, a burnt umber, magenta, and a Payne's gray blue tone. I love magenta. Yeah. The magenta is awesome. And so I've mainly using them as washes just because they bring so much saturation and they work so much better than acrylic washes. So I can, I can wash cold stuff with the Payne's gray. I can wash warm stuff with the burnt umber. And then if I have anything that I want to look alive, I can put the magenta in it. So I put yeah. that around the faces and the hands of all the skinks that I paint and similar with, with humanoid figures. Um, and the magenta somehow it's like a, it's a super saturated magenta, but it works so well as a wash to just bring so much vibrancy mm. and you can mix it because it's magenta with the way it works on the color spectrum. I can mix it with either the cold toned blue or the warm toned brown and get a wonderful variety of colors between the two. Yeah. I would say I do a lot of experimenting with washes mm -hmm. of putting alternate colors on something or complementary colors on things to um, kind of just help things pop or to change the tone of something. Um, and I, uh, I, I haven't done enough with contrast stuff to, to look at like mixing colors or whatever with contrast, yeah. but um, uh, what's your favorite? Do you have a favorite either I mean, those are three three of your favorite colors, I guess, because you're using those three in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Do you have any any favorite colors that are in everything that you do? Yeah, um, I have a, a that Payne's gray blue tone. Um, yeah. The one I have right now is AK Dark Sea Blue. I use that very often as a universal shadow color. I almost never, and basically never use black on the models themselves. I'll either use this um, dark green blue or a, a very dark purple if I want to use shadows. I think that it adds so much more and is more realistic than black. And then I also, so that's one of my favorites, this dark sea blue. Um, one that I haven't really been able to mix is chartreuse. If you're not familiar with what that means, it's a very light greeny yellow. And I have this AK pistachio. Mm pistachio colored it's really hard to mix that color with just yellow and green at least yep. that i found so i use that one a ton and it mixes really well with the dark sea blue to produce mm. all shades of green in between i could paint with dark sea blue pistachio and white i can paint plants i can paint vibrant shields i can paint anything so i really like those two colors and then the third i probably say is just a, a, a primary blue is how i would describe it uh -huh. You know, a super saturated primary blue is the last color that I really like. Yeah. Uh, this stems from the fact that I am, in fact, partially colorblind. So I'm red, green, colorblind, and I can't see reds the most and a little bit of green. So blue is definitely my favorite color. Um, I use blue on most of my models. So it's, yeah. it's really nice, and it adds a nice punch that I don't get out of other colors. So I would say that those three are my big ones. Dark green, blue, a light green, yellow, and then primary blue. Nice. I mean, you do, working with dinos, like oh, yeah. ha having those those earthy base tones, uh, and then the pops of color and knowing what you want to use. Um, mine. So number one on every, I I bet it's on every model I own is rack hearth flesh. <laughs> yeah. uh, it is just this neutral, warm gray tone that that not only does it 
the the specific paint pot like it just it base colors anything yeah it's just a well well done paint um but with washes and dry brushing i can turn it into anything yeah um i use it on um on uh bone i use it on uh a base color with warp fire warp with was it warp fiend gray for both rocks and my aged wood and i just wash them and and <laughs> and differently yeah. um uh, another one terminata stone uh dry brushes on every freaking thing i have uh it's just a it's an off-white highlight that ends up just working really well uh if you don't overdo it right uh and it mm -hmm. depends on in some cases you overdo it and in some cases you just keep it light uh, i don't know if i hit mine's dark sea blue that ak uh but yeah. it is it's similar to um jukari there was a, um, a, a sea blue or a, a like greenish blue color that, mm -hmm. and I, I couldn't, so I got that too. And I've been using that a lot as well. Um, uh, what's another color? Um, also with rack hearth flesh, Bane blade Brown is okay. a step down and, yeah. um, was it pallid witch flesh is a highlight for that as well. Like mm -hmm. three, those three together I, I use in a lot of, of different things. Um, and then I'm still a sucker for Agrax, uh, yeah. or shade. Uh, it just, it's like a warm cup of coffee. It's like yeah. apple cider donuts. It just feel like it, it just, if you, if you ever have a question of what to do <laughs> with a bottle, put Agrax on it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a good paint. The formula has changed over the years. I think I like the last version better than this version, but it's still good. Um, Burnt Umber oil paint is very, very similar, and yeah. I use it very often. It, it looks so nice. Yeah. Um, but then there's a, an assortment, because I do the same. When I, like, when I pick a new army, I end up picking out a few paints, bringing those home, working with them, and then somehow they work themselves into other things. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah. Um, you might try, I might have a couple of greens for you to try that are from the games workshop, but if you'd like your pistachio, um, do you have any, you talked about using oils for washes. Do you have any favorite painting techniques? Uh, I will say that you have developed kind of a painterly style where you let your brush strokes stay visible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, when you, I think some people don't know when you work like with, with, canvases and stuff like that if you go and see art you know at museums like you see brush strokes you see yes. the marks they make uh with oil you're not going over it over and over and over like you're laying paint down where you want it you're being uh yeah you know depending on the painter but you're being yeah. deliberate right so do you have any any techniques that you like uh or yeah yeah for sure i can i can talk about or, that or tools i mean i know that you harp on me a little bit on uh no, wet palette I know where you're going. uh yeah if you don't have a wet palette guys make one um just use an old tupperware lid and some layers of paper towel and then parchment paper on top it makes acrylic painting so much easier even it's it doesn't work to like store paint overnight but you can put yeah. out drops of the paint on the palette yeah and it'll stay there for however long you need it to as you're actively painting i've used it for you know hours in a row and it stays nice yeah. rather than dropping it out on like a piece of paper or a dry palette and it dries yeah. up right away or <laughs> you can just take your paintbrush dip it in the water however much you want to get a little bit of water in your brush dip it in the pot mix it on the edge and then put it on your model it's there's lots of ways to do this i, I don't disagree with you but <laughs> no, I, I do i um, think no i there is when i have used a, a wet palette and I want to like really that's I get out of wet palette when I really want to dig into like painting when I want to when mm -hmm. I want to like like when I get into tattoos on models or if I want to get into like fine detail or fine highlights and I really want yeah. to make sure that the paint isn't going to gunk up or it's I want it to 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 move smoothly over the model yeah and and then then the wet palette is absolutely the right move I like um, it because it helps so much with mixing colors. Mm. You know, as I as I work through a model, I'll put out the 10 main colors that I'm using, you know. And then if I want to paint something a different color, I can just 
mix it right there on the palette. I don't need to go digging through and find a brown. I could just mix it close enough color. And then because I've already used those colors on the model, it really looks very cohesive in the end. If I start from the same, you know, 10 to 15 colors and paint everything with a mix of those, it really looks nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as, far as, as far as brush strokes go, like you said, if you, if you go to an art museum, you're going to have to go to back to like the Renaissance era to find really nicely blended stuff. Um, yeah. Most modern art, most even like contemporary art is not, is quite frankly, not like blended that well. And yeah. even when you walk around in, in real life, stuff isn't, stuff isn't like super smooth blends everywhere. Yeah. When you, when you try and paint stuff to look realistic, I, I think that that's definitely where the current like best style of painting is, is, is realistic stuff, but there's so many other, you know, general styles of painting, you know, impressionistic or, or whatever that are really fun to explore. And you can use those on, on a, on a mini and you don't need to worry about getting rid of all the brush strokes. You don't need to worry about, um, making everything smooth. Yeah. And I think that focusing on high contrast, focusing on stuff that looks good on the tabletop is way better than trying to focus on something that looks perfect when you're staring at it, painting it, it you'll, you'll notice a lot more of an effect uh, that way. Yeah. I, uh, I have a few places where, so I have another, a stroke that always works for me or so. Wait a second. Th this works, this works for wet palettes too, but I most often do this, uh, with a paintbrush dipping in pots. I, I load up the, my brush with the, the, usually the highlight color that I want. Yeah. And then I will dip the tip in another paint pot and I will find where my recess is or where my, the dark, and usually that's a darker either version of it, or it's what I want to blend from one of the other. So my recent maw pot, uh, yeah. I, my, the fleshy tones go from a magenta in the recesses out to an, an orange. Uh, I use towel light, light ochre. I load my brush with towel light ochre and then I, I, get a, a tip of magenta and then I'll start in the recesses and I will paint back and forth and I will use up the magenta and then it will blend. So like, like a sunset yeah. into the orange yeah. and then I'll finish up the orange. The orange will be all that's left on the brush and I will finish up the space. And that's one of yeah, my favorite awesome. techniques. Um, it gives you very smooth blends. Uh, it's, but it is similar where you're sort of committing, like I can't mm -hmm. easily redo it. So it takes yep. some time to, to get used to it or to kind of figure it out. I mean, you can redo it. Like nothing's permanent. Um, yes. uh, uh, and, and sometimes if I have a big space, I will paint what my dark color up to one spot, my light color up to one spot. And then I'll use that technique to blend in between the two. Um, yeah. and, and I really enjoy that, that when that unlocked, it's one of those things where it is not, it is not a complex technique but you have to, you have to try it and wrap your head around it. Uh, and then once you do, you can execute it pretty easily. Yeah. If anybody's looking for that technique, I think the, the term people use in miniature painting is loaded brush blending, hmm. um, works really well. If you, yeah. if you learn wet blending, which is another mini painting term, um, that's a good step into that loaded brush blending and that Maw Pot looks fantastic. You do really good work with that style. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And wet blending is sort of, you you put some paint on the model that's and then while it's wet, you go get some more paint and then you can blend that into that. Mm -hmm. Um so you don't have to do it all on the same brush. Or if you you know, some people use two different brushes or whatever. Um yeah. Uh, I can't juggle that many. Um although uh, I do I often have a couple of sizes, but I end up using the one with the best point. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um wet blending I've always done it with one brush. And you what I what I do is I'll lay down the, like a base color over everything and then you just go back with your highlight color and you touch those highlight areas you can kind of mush it around and get the the highlight areas to blend into yeah. the, the base coats yeah um and i i like what you said about um not trying to make things perfect um mm -hmm. even if even if like one of the first things i learned to do is just stay in the lines right like color in the lines um i'll i'll say my my easiest technique for that is you paint you paint the the color of the raised areas. So maybe that's the metals or whatever. I find it's easier 
to paint into the recesses. Okay. Because paint sort of just pools, right? Okay. You can sort of like more easily get paint to fill the space inside. Um, uh, so if you're painting chaos, like paint all the metal, uh, be messy with it. And then you can, it's easier to be cleaner filling in the, the, the armor in between those metal ridges and stuff like that. Hmm. Um, uh, I painted a whole castle uh, on that technique. Uh, yeah. So it was just easier to paint in the, the kind of facade portions of it uh, after I'd already gotten the metals down. Uh, cool. you, you sort of, you treat those as like barriers, right? Cause they're usually yeah. raised. And so you just paint up to them and your brush stops a little bit more easily. Then the flip side, which I've done as well, where you've got everything one color and then you have to go through and paint the metals and you're paint, trying to paint the edges without yeah. painting the, the facade that you've. Yeah, done. that's that's super interesting. I, I honestly use both depending on, you know, what the situation calls for or if I screw it up, you know, yeah. if I screw up adding in that metal part, then of course I'm going to come back and do the edges. I think yep. it's definitely yep. worth trying out both and, you know, figuring out where each one works for you. On, um, I painted, I think it's Eflahim's Pandemonium. It's a Zinch Underworlds Warband. I painted mm. that recently and it has some some arm, armor panels with trim. And so on different pieces of the same warband, I would do the inside first and then come back and do the edge or do the edge and then do, do the inside later. And yeah. it just varies depending on the specific shapes. And well, stuff. I could see with them too, if they're, if they're mostly flesh with some you know things bangles and stuff like that or or leather or whatever that's mm -hmm. you're usually maybe putting the most time into the flesh and getting blends before you paint all the other stuff so i could definitely yeah. go in the other direction yeah um, from from a general standpoint the way i like to paint models is i like to paint the stuff on the inside that's hardest to reach with the brush first and then finish with the stuff on the outside because you're less likely to to touch the parts you've already finished if you paint the, all the outside stuff first and then you try and reach in with your brush to get to the inside, you're going to have a, maybe a harder time painting all that stuff. Sure. Um, do you have any favorite brushes? Um, my favorite brushes are the random assortment of old Citadel brushes that I've kept since I started the hobby a long time ago. Uh, I bought a couple of synthetic sable hair brushes that I wasn't super enthused with. And... Yeah, I think the one I think the brushes from Games Workshop I have are sable. I'm not sure. They've held up well enough. I think they are. But mm -hmm. I don't have any particular favorite brushes. I just pick up whatever one, like you said, has the nicest point and yeah. go from there. Uh the the Artificer uh paintbrush from Games Workshop is a Windsor Newton, which okay. is probably the the sable that you've you've experienced. I like I like a bigger brush that has a you know like the bigger the brush you can hold more paint in it yes. uh, and so i definitely like something over a one i usually like a two mm -hmm. uh, uh and it can hold the same like the the it still comes to a really small tip um mm -hmm. uh but then you know uh it just takes some time getting used to using just the tip and not you know flattening the the brush on there i yeah. usually my brushes have a progression where they go from a fine point to a dry brush <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's just how they go <laughs> it's just how they go and, uh, and washing them can help extend that with like some brush soap but yeah that's just the way it is i've i've, I've heard those rumors too oh you, you know <laughs> brushes <laughs> am i making you uncomfortable Zach? i've got it right here eric you can borrow some <laughs> no um, i have oh i have some okay <laughs> i haven't bought any sable hair brushes in recent years um but maybe I should try and track down some stuff. Have, are you generally on the like painstaking detail side of painting or do you do some speed painting as well with it when it comes to the hobby and the models and that sort of stuff? I, I like both. Honestly, I think it's, it's very important to vary that within your hobby. Um, there are some models. Uh, I, I painted a chaos warband this year and I, I probably spent, less than 30 minutes per model. Um, nice. mm -hmm. But then, you know, when I did my Hunters of Huanchi, I probably spent one to two hours converting every single one of the claws, the Huanchi's claws models, and I had five of them. And then I probably spent three to four hours per model painting them, which is quite a long time. 
And you can see the difference in quality for sure mm -hmm. if you go close. But if you looked at them both on a table, they're looking for different things. You know, my Hunters of Quanchi is is aiming to be more of a realistic style. But then when I did the the Slaves to Darkness, the Nurgle Warband, it's very, very painterly. I used four paints, two, it was black, white, and two colors. So just trying to interpret that art style onto a mini is also a way to to paint quickly. Yeah. Well, and with that one, you kind of painted the warband or the, the the majority of the models uh quickly, and then you spent time uh with the icons on the shield. Oh, yeah. You know, so you did some freehand and yeah. uh got to try that on those big yeah. spaces. Yeah, um I took some some chaos warriors who have quite a lot of details and I spent some time scraping off all those details to make them <laughs> smooth. Um and then as I was waiting for games on league nights at Tuesdays, I would do some freehand on the shields just to to pass the time. And so that was a lot of fun. Which is a great way to distinguish your your mm -hmm. your here your, your, your sorry fighters mm -hmm. uh, so as you're keeping track of which one's taking damage or has an injury or whatever. Um, that was a cool thing to be able to have that detail where this one is very unique. So, uh, or where the models are mostly samesies. Yes, you created a way to make them unique. Um, yeah, I had four chaos warriors and two chaos knights, and if they're all painted monochrome, it's kind of hard to tell <laughs> who's who. So I had a skull on one guy's shield, and then some arrows on another guy's shield, and then a scythe on the third one. And so I had six different symbols, and then on my, I use a, a piece of paper to track the wounds and like different conditions for the fighters on the side. So I could say, oh, you're attacking the one with a skull. He takes two wounds. He's down to 13. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll say that my cog fort, my cities, the base of it is very fast. Yes. I, you know, I can base code it. I can get everything up to that patina really quickly. And then there's just, I pick out a few things to uh, highlight and then I can put some freehand time into the, mm -hmm. the cog 40, 40, 40 logo. And then um, my soul sworn were also pretty quick. I wanted, they would have been quicker if they were all the same, but I picked, you know, six different chambers for them to come from but i wanted to kind of just get the idea down and i think that that's often where i stop yeah painting or or, or building i was like is as soon as the like the like 80 percent of the idea has been captured i'll i'll often slow down or you know leave that last 20 percent to finish some other time yeah, well, that's that's not a bad thing. Um, if if you get more into painting, you know, over the years, you can learn how to paint a model to where you could just stop. You could just stop it any day, and it would look good. Um, yeah. With these skinks I'm currently working on, I did I did it with airbrushes and then oils, and then if I wanted to call it quits after the oil paints and do no like brush work, I could have done that, and I I can just spend whatever amount of time I want yeah. bringing it up and then move on. A super clean base coat, like get your however many colors you're going to put on it, two to three colors. And I tend to keep, like you, I tend to keep it pretty like limited. Mm -hmm. Limiting your your color scheme is really important for getting things done quickly uh, and being able to spend time on them. Uh, get a solid, clean base coat and wash it. Yeah. And you, you're, you're, I think that's tabletop to me. Oh, um, absolutely. That's well and above tabletop. If if you if you get to that point you're, and you can spend whatever time you want highlighting whatever details, you know, with with a lot of Games Workshop models and a lot of just models, especially 3D prints nowadays, they have so many like bojangles and gobbledygook going on that being able to just, you know, paint the important parts and then give those a brown, a base coat brown and a wash, that's totally fine. You yeah. know, you don't need to worry about what color to paint the boots. You paint the boots brown and move <laughs> on. Um yeah, I'm trying to think through uh, uh, different times where, uh, like, like, yeah, there's room to kind of get to, let's say, stage A mm -hmm. and be very happy with getting them on the table and then mm -hmm. later come back and, and go further. And I think that that's probably where I enjoy, I mean, with Warcry, we sometimes want to test out some models or test out oh, yeah. a warband. Uh, I mean, you played your um, Chaos uh, Slaves of Darkness for one league, and mm -hmm. you found out that that warband wasn't necessarily your favorite to play. Yeah. Um, but, and that, 
made it really suited for doing something quick. Like mm -hmm. you enjoy uh, putting models on the table and, and having painted models. And that's, yeah. Uh, that's a large part of why we do this is to have these visually stunning or visually cinematic games. Um, and so being able to do it quick to get the look and feel and the experience that you wanted was the right move for that, that, um, army that you sort of like dipped into and dipped out of. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it's, it's definitely nice to be able to, especially with the way we form in our leagues and just the smaller number of models. If you want to move on, you can move on. If you want to do more depth, you can as well. And Warcry is really nice in the fact that there's such a wide variety of factions. You can always find something new to play. And like I said earlier, people are very, very generous with what models you can use. Um, so if you find some cool models and you want to paint those, just paint those and pick some rules for them. Well, let's talk about sourcing models. Um, sure. Where, where do you prefer to get models? Do you, um, are you like me, you know, spending a lot of time on the Games Workshop website going, hey, I like this. What else could it be? other than what they intended it to be. How do mm -hmm. I make it my own? Or uh, are you looking a lot at 3D prints uh, or um, uh, old model ranges that are out of print and that you just love and think are cool? Yeah, honestly, it's a good mix. Um, the one thing that I don't normally do is buy new plastic from Games Workshop or from the local hobby store. I, like I said, I played fantasy and that was back in middle school, believe it or not. I played eighth edition fantasy and I played lizard men. I had some other friends that played like high elves, dwarves, warriors of chaos, and then high school rolled around. They all quit. So they gave me their old models. So one of the places I go shopping for models is my <laughs> giant backlog of fantasy miniatures. Um, uh, other places to source models. I find like clearance racks at local game stores are fantastic because you can find all sorts of cool stuff. Um, here in here in Madison, we're blessed with a couple of stores that carry a lot of off-brand stuff, um, not just Games Workshop. So I like to just see what other models are, are out there because a lot of them are absolutely the same quality as Games Workshop and look just as nice when they're painted up and are just as easy or even better to assemble, um, especially the resin stuff. Resin from Games Workshop has, has got a really bad rep, but if you get resin from a different company, it's usually very nice. Um, and then online places, I do a lot, of, a lot of trolling through eBay. You can find lots of out of print stuff or old stuff that most people maybe not like anymore for relatively cheap. Um, and even though it's not the current hot thing coming out from Games Workshop. There will always be new cool models. And if, if you really want something that's new, just give it like six months and you can find it for 30% off on eBay built. And then you don't have to build it. <laughs> yeah, I tend to, I tend to try you know, like as a creative uh, in my day job, I find boundaries are a great way to to be inspired and to be creative, like having some restrictions. Like if everything's wide open, uh, it doesn't feel as, it's harder to come up with, I think the best work when it's just do anything. So one of mine is, is I do try and work with Games Workshop only uh, models. Couple of reasons. One, uh, I love the ease of their plastic. Like I know what it works, how it works. I yeah. know I know the material. I know what I can do with it. I'm comfortable cutting, carving, reattaching, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't touch metal. I will not touch metal. Uh, I, I, I think I have one or two metal pieces, but like done. Um, it's just not worth my time. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, uh, get out of here. Metal. <laughs> um, resin's fine. Like I've, I carve, re I can carve resin and like cut it up and reimagine it. Like that's not a problem. I don't do a lot of it. Um, uh, but also I have this idea of like, what if I want to play this army at Warhammer world? Sure. Uh, I want, I need everything to have uh, games workshop plastic. There's a When's couple the last of time you went to Warhammer world, Eric. I went one time for about an hour. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, let me know. It was uh I was sick uh, because I, <laughs> I caught something on the, on my trip. So, uh, yeah. but anyway, um, but it's just this weird thing in my head where I was like, yeah. I want, 
or to put it on the website or something like that. Like, yeah, I, I, I don't think I've ever had any of my, I take that back. I think my, my, um, I have had a couple of things show up like, again, on the old website, when you'd go to a model and then it showed like how people painted. Oh, yeah. I remember that. It was so cool. Uh, I think I had a model up on there. I don't remember which one. That's really cool. Huh? Um, so, um, I try and stick with plastic because I, I can like Lego pieces. Like I can mm -hmm. take this piece and this piece and I know I can put those things together easily. I love plastic glue. Oh yeah. It is like, I don't like super glue as mm -hmm. much by like, it's like, I like it one tenth as much as I like plastic glue. Um, and so that's the other piece is like, I like how it bonds so well and how strong it makes the final piece. Um, if I have to work with putty and pinning and that sort of stuff, I do, but it's just, it's still not my favorite. Yeah. Um, I definitely appreciate that. I mean, Games Workshop makes expensive models, but they're expensive because they're pretty much the best. Like the new stuff always looks just beautiful and the kits almost always, shout out Bonehole, go together fantastically. <laughs> Um, I think you, you put a bad rap on the metal models. Uh, they're, they're not great. I'm not going to lie, but I really like how heavy they are when I move them around on the board. I think that's yeah. fun. So yeah. there's a point for them. You know, the plastic models are hollow and if you wanted to, you could fill them. I, I don't think they'd be as hefty as these, these big oh. old war machine models. They're, okay. they're yeah. Yeah. Big. She's also though, if somebody gets mad and flips the table. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nobody does that. No, <laughs> that's those are myths. Um, Maybe Mike will do that. But uh, but I do a lot. It took me a lot, a little while to get comfortable cutting up an eighty dollar model or a yeah. hundred dollar oh, model. Um, and some of that is trusting yourself that you know what I'm going to make this cut, and if it doesn't totally work out, I can just glue it back together the way it was. Mm -hmm. um, and some of it is starting small, right? Mm -hmm. uh, head swaps or weapon swaps or you know uh you know my my cog fort are old and i don't know if i i think i've got enough for what i have but they were old empire heads on skitari bodies yeah. um and then uh cog shields sourced from you know amazon or whatever you know like mm -hmm. it's and and so it just starts with you know like head swaps and you can kind of make something brand new uh yeah. in that in that little way um and then it's you know or you reposition you cut off mm -hmm. cut an arm at an elbow and you twist it a little bit and re-glue it back on and that weapon is at a different angle and you've created something that's unique like no other model you can build one version of the model as is and then the next version has an arm that went from here to here and it's, yep. it's unique i did that on my uh blood bowl team because it's two sprues that are identical yeah and the same five guys so i you know, just switched up the arms and the tails on the the Saurus. Yep, yep. Head swaps and and weapon swaps are are a nice way to get into converting, and they do so much for the model. Even just changing those mm -hmm. two smaller parts. Yeah, I gave all of my Necromunda um, minor dwarves. I gave them little hammers from the old or from the dispossessed kits, and uh, it, it looks so cool. It looks yeah. so good. Uh, two of them have chainsaws, which is a little, I don't like those as much. Oh, okay. Such They're, a small change can completely flip a model from sci-fi to fantasy or, or vice versa. Yeah. There's so many, one of the most common ones I feel like is, um, lizard men with guns is a very popular, like Tau proxy. Yeah. So you can search up that online and you'll find people, they'll take like the antenna off the Tau and give them a gun. And then it, it all of a sudden you got a sci-fi space lizard. It's pretty fun. Well, it's shooting lasers. Um, yeah. And I mean, that's the thing though, is like, cause in fantasy they're space lizards. So like, yeah. it, the, the, the jump isn't hard. No. Nope. Um, uh, yeah. I think that, uh, I, like I said, painting sci-fi stuff with earth tones, right? If you paint space Marines with brown leather, like straps and, and that sort of thing, like, you know, you can't quite get a space Marine to fantasy. I don't think, but I think you could <laughs> take the well, shoulder pads off. I back in the helmet and you you'd be fine. I've seen um Stormcast Space Marines, which I think yep. are pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Um uh, how then let's we've talked through, you know, kind of we we 
I think painting is the space where there's so many tools to explore, so many different types of paints and and things, and it, it can be very daunting. And it's probably has the most like history of that you can draw from and inspiration yeah. you can draw from. Uh, uh, the building part, what materials you use, is a lot about what do you have access to, what mm -hmm. do you what do you like, um, and whether you convert or not. You know, some people it's just not for them. Some of us have an addiction, um, and it's okay. Um, and there's there's so many a lot of the techniques we talk about are the things which is about, you know, doing and adding a new technique to your repertoire ever so often as you progress. Sure. Um, uh, last, maybe the last piece of the puzzle is basing. Oh, uh, you go a little bit crazy with basing. I love basing. It's a lot of fun. What do you love so much about basing? Um, basing does so much to like tie the model together. You could, and it's relatively easy to just throw some washes and dry brushes onto a base. Um, and then it adds just su such a level of like framing to the, to the model. Um, you can go as wild as you want. What I like to do on my really large bases um, is, for example, on Lord Croak, I've got a Lord Croak and he's got a bunch of jungle stuff on his face. And I've also mm -hmm. added a couple of skinks, like just straight up skink models that you would normally put on a 25 millimeter base. I just threw them right on his base because I've got, Lord knows I've got plenty of those laying around. Yeah. I think I have like 50 painted and I'm working on 30 more. Um, so I've got plenty of those lying around and adding just those, those little details that help immerse the model into the world. Yeah. And then my, the best part about basing is when you paint the base room and you give it a nice frame, so you yep. can paint the base room, whatever color you want, as long as it's black. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think basing such, you know, you're choosing the world that they're, they're most comfortable in, right. That they're mm -hmm. most engaged in. Um, there's times where I still go back to just, uh, grit on with glue, Mm -hmm. uh and then you know some flock on top of it like it's mm -hmm. still just a classic um uh it's some but it's another one where every single one of my army is in a different place i used um i used uh silicon caulk for my um undead basing so it was just like muck and mud and oh, like that's cool you know it's just smeared around and it's like just a slurry um yeah. and so like you can use so many different things for basing um, uh, so yeah, there's, it's just a place that you, you can, you can go yeah, hang on. Yeah. I have a couple of fun basing schemes that I did. I'm painting up a towel riptide. It's been like a two year process. Um, okay. but for the base, I wanted to do something a little different. I wanted to kind of mimic like a city street and I have like a section of sidewalk and then there's a little terrace where I'm going to put grass in. I've got a, a sci-fi looking thing that I want to paint red, like a fire hydrant. And then I got the road like the busted up road that he's standing on. Mm. So being able to, you know, do something a little weird that maybe you're not typically seeing, but more of a recognizable yeah. base for that is fun. Um, if you want rubble, uh, I did this for when I, so I originally built, brought, bought Skitari uh, or the Mechanicus, Adeptus Mechanicus, because I wanted to build a Mechanicus army. For yeah. 40K. Uh, playgrounds, sometimes have the chewed up rubber yeah oh, it's beautiful rubble <laughs> because it's it's got hard edges yeah it's got sometimes got print on it uh okay. so it looks like you know like uh manufactured materials uh, so where'd you source that from uh playgrounds my kids were <laughs> two and three and two and five years old and i had every right to be on that playground that's silly um yeah. <laughs> my one of my more recent additions to my basing materials is uh spacking compound so it's just the stuff you use to fill in walls oh yeah I, so i've got this here and then i just mixed a decent Ooh. amount of black acrylic paint in so now yeah. it's a dark gray black spacking and it's really nice because it's got the grit in it just like a texture paste would and it's slightly flexible because that's what spacking's meant to do mm. and it also doesn't shrink when it dries because that's what spacking's meant to do so it's a super cheap i think it was like two dollars for this container yeah. and if you go and buy a if you buy the little gw pots of texture paste <laughs> that'll probably run you about 50 bucks so yeah yep 
that's been a nice one. I uh, recently took out some orchid potting mix for rocks on my skinks. You can't really see it in the picture, but sure. if you glue down the orchid mix and then cover it up with layers of paint and I use some spacking to fill in the gaps, all of a sudden it looks like rocks and, and rubble peeking out from underneath uh, some moss or something. And awesome. that, I'm really impressed with how the, the orchid potting mix looks. It's some larger pieces of bark basically, but Again, it's a non-hobby material. It's a little weak. I've had to basically soak it all in super glue uh, as I glue it down to the bases, but okay. other, it looks fantastic. Yeah. I use, uh, I, I love this idea of just naming off weird uh, basing things that you use because it literally, similar, similar to your building your, mm -hmm. your ship, uh, you can just pull stuff from wherever. Um, a plastic wood filler. Okay. Uh, it's just a, there's a type of wood filler and it's, um, uh it's just it's it's got this interesting texture to it and it's reactivated with water huh. and so um it starts off as sort of like a nice creamy like material um but it because it it's when it's wet it sort of settles and it makes great sand dunes um and if you put sand dune, if you do that and then in some spots i did like crackle paint mm -hmm. and then i did uh just like sprinkles of of really fine sand not everywhere but so if you do little sprinkles then you can see that it's got sandy material but then the the wood glue seems like finer yeah than, than yeah. sand and then you you airbrush it all i airbrush a bone color and did a uh, a flesh wash mm -hmm. and it's and it's beautiful sand dunes yeah um, and you can you can like rake through it and you can make you know raise stuff or you could put in something there and you can like scoop it up so it looks like it's blown into the wall or mm -hmm. whatever uh that's a really cool material yeah i think that you brought up an interesting point there where mixing materials on a base is is highly encouraged i would say because anywhere in nature nothing is is homogenous for like Usually, most stuff isn't homogenous for a large area. Mm -hmm. So being able to like mix different textures and you can see some stuff is a little bit larger, some stuff is smaller. That definitely is is a nice added bit of realism that yeah. isn't too hard to do to just slap some crackle paint on or, or drop some sand on with some super glue. Yeah. And it really adds a lot. Yep. Um, yeah, if you have, it seems a little, a little um, ostentatious, but if you have extra models, <laughs> Like your skinks are a very understandable, like you can, you could have easily take like a model or two from a pack oh, yeah. of skinks. Um, my, my most ostentatious is I have, I made a, a zombie dragon or it's a zombie griffin. Yeah. Uh, and I had a zombie dragon that I didn't want to build as a zombie dragon. So I made it basing material. Oh boy. Yeah. that feels a little bad. Yeah. I've been there. I mean, in my mind, it's definitely harder when you're starting out to like sacrifice models. But if if you're if you're late into it, like the both of us are, it's all right to just say this model, even if I use it as basing, is going to get painted and just throw stuff onto the base and and call it good. You know, a painted model is better than one that sits in your closet for another two years. So, yeah. I, I I've definitely, as the years have gone on, I've been less cautious about just throwing paint on something or taking whatever I want out of the yeah. bits box. Uh, we mentioned, I guess I thought I, I have it in the notes basing, but one of the things that I didn't put on here that we talked about and we should probably spend some time on is the terrain is oh, the yeah. boards. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Warcry has had been the source of some of the best terrain games workshop yeah. has, has ever put out. And I'd say the flip to that would be Necromunda as well. Has yeah. some of the best terrain that they've ever come out with and some of that is because uh they built it with the idea of functionality of being able mm -hmm. to move around on it as opposed to being an obstacle or a you know a um you know a wall or a mountain in the middle of the the battlefield um what are some of like you've got a whole set of mm -hmm. narwood terrain did you just uh the hunters uh, or the which part of state Sundered fate, which was, yeah. was the, with the bone hole and, and that sort of stuff. 
Yeah, uh, that had uh, Hunters of Huanchi and Jade Obelisk. And I supplemented cool. that with a couple extra um, trees that it was an old Citadel, the old Citadel Woods kit from a very long time ago. I had that. So I supplemented that with a couple trees, some 3D printed uh, extra jungle bits, and then turned it into a bit of a jungle board. Um, yeah. You brought up that idea of functionality. I think what's nice about the Warcry terrain and why I like it usually more than the AOS terrain is because you're moving single models around the board. So Games Workshop doesn't need to design the Warcry terrain to be able to fit entire units like you would in Age of Sigmar or like the giant monsters on a big pie plate bases. We don't need to worry about that in Warcry. So they you can build and they can come up with kits that are much more detailed. And, you know, you have little walkways that are precariously placed. And sure, you knock them over during the gameplay, but <laughs> roll a fall test and set it back up. Um, I think that Warcry is definitely nice and it plays really, really well with a ton of terrain. It can help rein in the uh, quite strong, slow moving fighters that we currently have and mm -hmm. really adds to the cinematic experience to just fill the board with terrain. Yeah, I've I've played on uh, boards that are just big towers with spaces to walk on. Um, yeah. And and it works. It just it works no matter what you've got on. And so like it's um what we loved about season one was um reimagining the bloodwind spoils one of the eight like territories within the eight points and yeah. kind of hoped hey are we gonna get go around that pie and and see the different different ones and get and we got the the um uh red harvest terrain which was totally different uh super tall like even bigger yeah. like you know uh spances um We've got the catacombs, which uh, this past uh, week, uh, one of our uh, less frequent, uh, coming from you know a little further away, Sean brought um, a big. Everybody's done this, right? You've either gotten a new television or a new packed box, and in there there's like foam or uh, you know paper mache or like whatever forms. Yeah. And you're like, hey, could I use that for war gaming? Right? Could I use that for war cry? He took one and it was this big one piece of styrofoam that was exactly the right size, 11 by or 22 by 30, and had all these different um, sections and rooms. And he, he made doors and he made all this kind of stuff. And he made a catacombs table with this so one solid piece of styrofoam. Yeah, that's and a it's so creative. sweet board. That's such a sweet board. Um, Sean, you should be proud of that if you're listening. I, I really like that. That thing is awesome. And if if people are listening and they're thinking about doing that, you don't need to worry about it being exactly the right size. You know, the mm -hmm. rules rules are rules, and you can just modify them. You can add extra turns on. You can move the deployment points, whatever. It's a lot Warcry is very, you know, narrative and cinematic. And so if you want to just tweak some rules that you don't like or you don't think will work, just do it. It's it's not a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is the next board that you're thinking of working oh. on? Well, I'm gonna break my rule of trying to not share projects before I do uh, them because then... you don't no, you don't have to. You don't okay. don't make I'm don't have you don't have to be I don't peer pressure. So you and don't quite quite frankly, I, I'm not thinking of anything. I've got one idea floating around, but honestly, I'm going to wait throughout the year, see if any of the terrain kits Games Workshop comes up with. Yeah. That's my fancy. And when I want to build a board, I'll build a board. I like nice. using the uh, the neoprene like mouse pad mats. Okay. Spending another 30 bucks to get one of those versus the fold out cardboard boards. I yeah. think they look I think they look nicer and they play nicer, but yeah, it's a little bit of a splurge. If I don't buy Games Workshop terrain, I can definitely splurge on the, uh, the neoprene <laughs> mat nice um yeah i've i've got uh the cog for it is a, a bit of an ambitious project because it's got a bunch of uh, bips and bobs and i've got to more things i want to do to it to make it more fantasy feeling yeah. like it, it should have more you know uh heraldry banners uh it needs to have um you know uh a bit more like low-tech stuff um added to it to make it you know, some color schemes that make it feel like, you know, old, um, 
you know, when you would have a joust or a, like a party in the medieval times and you'd have yeah. heraldry from each of the knights and they'd have different colors. So a little bit more like Bretonian, um, you know, feeling of, of kind of a, of a place to, uh, so I've got, I've got some work to do, uh, on that. Um, but I'm tempted to get a third, uh, <laughs> set of it just to get as much like height, like yeah, just to play with height, uh, with that. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but there's already with what I have, like I can, I can put together a pretty cool, um, uh, a board yeah. with, with, uh, some fun stuff. And that's, I love the different game styles we get to play with Warcry, oh, yeah. but siege is one of my favorites, uh, still kind of, so there's a little bit of a Holy grail of what's the perfect siege battle. What are the perfect mm -hmm. rules to make that a fun push pull, uh, yeah. kind of feel. Um, uh, but yeah that's that's the next board i want to oh that's the a board that i've started that i want to really you know like bring to fruition um, yeah I've, and, I've played on what you've got so far and it, it's been a lot of fun obviously i can't wait to see it done and i would love to get a game in on it when you do get it done yeah i appreciate it well you know we've talked through a few of our things that we love about the hobby what we think makes uh, uh playing this game fun the ways that we dig into it the things that uh techniques and tools and and that sort of stuff anything else that you would add to the conversation around what makes uh you know war cry a superior hobby game um the game is fun i think that's definitely a big part of it being able to paint something for a fun game is definitely important and i think that there's just so many opportunities you can do whatever you want and you can get paint on models and move on to the next one. You know, that's a fantastic point. I think the narrative gaming side of it, that it lends itself to the narrative so well that I love um, bringing a story together with the the models and the warband that you build and being able to play it out and see like what that story is going to be for that warband uh, through a league or through an event or something like that. So I think... I do think that the the style of gaming that we get to do with this really yeah accentuates the the a war band that you've put the time and energy into creating yeah um all right well zach thanks again for coming on uh thanks for for making an appearance uh uh i if you hadn't uh come it would just be me talking by myself <laughs> about yeah. hobby uh and nobody wants to hear that um uh where can they find where could people come and find some of your warbands and things you've painted um is there anywhere on the internets they can yeah. see it well first and foremost thanks for having me i'll say that first it's been it's been a pleasure um always happy to talk about hobby if you'd like to find me on discord i'm on the mortal realms discord my username is zach um and my profile picture is kixie taka if you go on the big Warcry Discord, my name is Kixie Taka, and my profile picture is also Kixie Taka. <laughs> That's the uh, the Seraphon Underworld's Warband leader. And the profile picture is the one that I painted, and I'm really happy with that model. But anyways, you can find me on Discord there um, pretty often. You can find me in Madison playing Warcry, and you mm -hmm. can find me on Instagram at paintbrushes underscore and underscore par underscore saves. It's my joint painting and disc golf uh, <laughs> Instagram account, mostly painting. But if you really want to dig into most of my whips, uh, like work in progress pictures, I've got most of them posted on the big Warcry Discord. There's a thread in the showcase forum called Zach Paints, and it's got pretty much all the pictures. I take pictures pretty much every day of what I paint and just drop it in there. And sometimes I'll scroll through just to look at it. Nice. Nice. Awesome. Uh, you can find me on our Discord uh, under Eric uh, or Stone Monk. Um, and uh, that is the mortalrealms.com forward slash Discord. Uh, you can also find uh, this podcast. Uh, I should have said this at the top of the episode. All of our podcasts are obviously, you're listening to them through a podcast uh, app. But you can also find these on YouTube. We are recording video, talking face to face. Uh, come come look at us over there, uh, and that's uh, youtube.com forward slash the mortal realms. 
Uh, you can also find our, our website, themortalrealms.com, uh, for our blog posts. And I've got quite a bit of my hobby blog is on there. Uh, look under blogs and, and look at Stone Monk Gamer. Um, and uh, if uh, you like what you hear, uh, if you're enjoying these episodes and you want to support the Mortal Realms uh, podcast network, you can go to themortalrealms.com forward slash Patreon and join up. Sometimes we have uh, special episodes and content uh, on releases that are just for our patrons. Uh, and uh, you're welcome to join us there if you'd like to. So again, thanks, Zach, for uh, coming. Thank you, listeners, for listening. And we will see you next time.